You are in for a huge treat this morning. Folks who have seen Danelle Holly speak before know of what I speak when the next hour is going to fly by in a flash and you are gonna get more out of it than you ever knew you could. Um, we're very excited for Danelle's session today, Tele Health Telemedicine Services. Strange world today, isn't it? We were just chatting about that before we let you all into the room. Um, but without further ado, I am going to turn things over to Danelle. There she is. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> there we go. Everybody can see okay? Good. That's right. exactly right. Good. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I am really sad that we can't all be together. I can't tell you how much the PCC conference means to me. I don't know how long I've been doing it. Dan, probably what, 10, 12 years, I suppose. Oh, longer than that, I think. I think <laughs> as long as I've been there, which is... Well, don't, the yeah, we don't need to you know, go into how old we are, but anyway. Um, and so I really miss this conference. I miss talking to my friends. I feel like a lot of you have become friends to me. Um, physicians, billing, practice administrators, all of you. Um, so I really miss you and I wish we could be together, but it truly is a strange world we have going on today. Um, for those of you who might be tuning in for the first time, my name is Donna Holly, I'm a registered nurse and um, my email address, as you can see on the screen is dholly at pedscoding.com. You are welcome to email me questions. I hope for most of you that are listening, you already know that. Um, you also might want to know that I have three different gadgets that I get email on. Um, and so hopefully uh, you get an answer fairly quickly and maybe it's not more than three answers, but sometimes that happens too. Hopefully they're the same answer. Anyway, I started out in a solo practice. It was just myself and a physician. And I put the patient in a room and got him started, Doc went in, did his thing, came back out. I finished him up, back at the desk and filed their insurance. Life was pretty easy back then. And then we got a CPT code book back in 1978. So that kind of tells you how old I am. I look like I'm only 28, but um, I'm not. <laughs> I know, you're all thinking, whew, this lady is nuts. But anyway, um, so uh, I got into this business because what I learned was if we don't do things the way the payers want, we don't get paid. And in pediatrics, all you want to do is take care of children. That's all you want to do. You don't want to mess with all of the other stuff that we have to mess with. The documentation, the timing, the codes, the billing. But we don't have a choice anymore. And until things really change on that end, we're kind of stuck. So today we're going to talk about telehealth and telemedicine services. and some of the slides are going to look very, very busy to you. I'll go through uh, most of them, but some of them I'm going to let you read on your own. It's really just good information for you to know. It's not something you have to memorize. It's, it's not something that if you don't uh, look at it, you're not going to be able to do the service. That's absolutely not the case. I just want you to be sure to understand I'm trying to give you as much information as possible. That's what I always try to do. Okay. Make sure you, you, um, do the questions as we go along and, and we'll get to the end and, and go ahead and try to answer those for you. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. This is just my notice and disclaimer. I do have one more though. Um, if there's spelling errors or punctuation errors, they were done by an insurance company just to make me look bad. I usually blame that on UHC, of course. That's my thing, all right? So we start out by asking, what does this symbol mean? Well, this symbol was presented about two years ago, and it's the modifier 95, which means synchronous telemedicine service rendered via a real-time interactive audio and video telecommunication system. Um, the telemedicine procedures and services involve electronic communication using interactive real-time synchronous telecommunication equipment with audio video at a minimum. So this 95 modifier two years ago was, was put into CPT, now, Medicare didn't take this modifier. Medicare uses a different one, but was put into CPT to say that if you're going to do a telemedicine, and if I'm talking telemedicine, I'm talking an office visit. If you're doing telemedicine, you have to use this modifier. Well, okay, for two years, if this modifier was used and you were paid, did you do it correctly? Because there were a huge number of rules 
that as the last two years went on, it, I really worried about because they weren't following the rules that actually went with telemedicine at the time. Um, so previous to March, about March 15th or so, um, there were only a few codes that could be used before the national emergency. They required an originating site and, and a, um, a provider site. And what that typically meant was that the only way you could do a telemedicine service is the, the person, the patient had to be in a facility. So if you wanted to do an ADHD recheck on a child or a young adult, who's in college, they would have to go to the college infirmary for you to be able to do that. But because of the national emergency, that's all been deleted. Uh, each month, CMS has come out with more and more codes that can be utilized for telehealth. Pretty much anymore, it's almost the whole entire CPT, well, not the surgical section, you know, not the section beginning with the 10000 to the 69999. Those are not there. Uh, labs are not there. X-rays are not there. Um, but all of our typical ones that we're going to use are there. Okay. Uh, but CMS is one. Remember, they're one person. AMA is another person. Uh, and they kind of pretty much have the same rules and regulations when it comes to the, the telehealth, telemedicine services. However, the commercial payers pretty much can do what they want to do. Um, a lot of them appear to be following CMS. Um, and of course, our hope is that they will continue to follow CMS in the future. We'll see. Uh, some of these codes, including screenings such as developmental and Vanderbilt's. Okay, so if you send out a Vanderbilt to a parent and you get it back and you do an interp and report on it, you can bill that out as telemedicine or telehealth, actually. Um, office visits do require the modifiers and place of service codes can be different than the normal ones used in visits. Uh, we have a couple different ones that we're gonna look at. The 95 modifier is used on a virtual office visit. I use my little quote here. Um, and that 95 modifier says, look, we're doing a 99213 virtually. And virtually means we are doing it with synchronous real-time audio video, okay? Uh, place of service for an office visit is typically going to be an 11. So if you have an office visit, 95 modifier, 11 place of service, okay? Now, this is just the AAP guidance, uh, telehealth payer policy. In response to COVID-19, uh, they came out with this and said, you know, payers, this is what you should be doing. Now, whether they all do this or not um, is kind of up to them. Although, to be honest with you, I have found very few that are not following uh, CMS AAP on what they're suggesting, um, allowing for home as an originating uh, a site and distant provider at their own office, waiving geographic uh, restrictions, allowing telehealth to be for new and established, because originally it was only for established. Um, and follow the March 17th, the HHS uh, Health and Human Resources came out and said, look, um, we're going to allow for good faith use of non-HIPAA compliant end-to-end -end communications, such as Skype, FaceTime. Zoom, okay? And so because it's supposed to be um, um, a system that is very HIPAA compliant, well, we know FaceTime might not be. And so they came out, CMS came out and said, look, we're going to uh, close our eyes to that piece because, because a lot of patients don't have the capability of having a secure website. Um, so, or to be able to get into it. So uh, that's why they have allowed the non-compliant or non-HIPAA compliant end to end. Um, pay for telehealth care visits for parity with in-person visits, which they are doing. Uh, provide retroactive payment and waive cost sharing. So it, it's kind of nice. They also eliminated any frequency limitations because it used to be very limited on what you could do. So it's kind of nice that they came out with this. And like I said, I have found most payers are following these policies. Now, of course, when this 
national emergency ends, will they continue it? Nobody knows. I, I certainly am hopeful that they will because they have found, I'm sure they have found that much care can be given through telehealth and telemedicine that maybe couldn't be given before. Um, we have parents that can't take off of work. Maybe it'd be nice for them to be able to call in on their lunch hour and talk to you. Now, certainly there are many, many things that we'd rather see the children for, but if we can't, it would be nice to know we could do that phone call and still be able to bill and get paid for it, different than we have had in the past, okay? So all, interestingly, all telehealth services are telemedicine, but not all telemedicine is telehealth. Now, what I mean by that is telemedicines are services provided through the real-time audio video. Telehealth, however, can be educational sessions with staff, other providers, and not necessarily related to patient care. So there is a difference between the two, although they're kind of, kind of intermingled together. Telemedicine codes include office visits, outpatient services, 99201 to 99215, um, well care, 99381 to 99397. Now, keeping in mind part of that well care, like the examination, will probably have to be performed at a later date. Um, and when they do come in, by the way, at a later date, if you've billed already your well care visit, you're not going to bill for that exam piece. You can certainly bill for anything else performed during that time. Um, and, and most of the ENM codes um, that are in the book, the psych codes, medical nutrition therapy, just to name a few, are also part of the telemedicine codes. Um, now, telehealth codes. We have a couple different sets of telehealth codes. The phone call codes, 99441 to 443 for physicians and qualified healthcare professionals. Now, and, and then 98966 to 98968, same service for non-physician healthcare professionals, such as social workers, nutritionists, dietitians. Interesting about these codes is they have been in CPT, I'm gonna guess for 25 years, probably. Easy, maybe 35, I don't know how long. A long, long time. And the reason I say that is because when I was still working in the office, which was a long time ago, um, I actually built some of these telephone call codes. None of them were paid. I only billed at $2. You would have thought I'd build a million dollars, but none of them were paid. We now know that these are being paid. Again, my hope is they'll be paid in the future. Another telehealth code are our digital e-visits. That's at 99421, 99423 for physicians and qualified healthcare professionals, and the 98970 to 98972, uh, same service for non-physician uh, non healthcare professionals, social workers, nutritionists, dietitians. Um, these are new codes. Um, these are using your portals, your uh, PCC portals work great. If you have secure email, now this does have to be secure email, um, then you can do these codes, okay? Um, documentation for telemedicine office visit. Well, first off, you need to understand if you're doing an office visit, you're doing an office visit. You have heard me, some of you have heard me preach and preach and preach about history, physical, and medical decision making. Um, right now, the visit needs to be based on history of medical decision making. Really, medical decision making should be the key to your teleoffice medicine visit. Uh, or time, you can use either one of those. Uh, and it has to be through real-time synchronous audio video equipment. Okay, so, so we wanna make sure we understand that. We can use FaceTime, Skype, Zoom, and they'll forgive the HIPAA compliance piece. Documentation still has to show your history and your limited exam if you did some. And, and the way, obviously, the exam is being performed is through the parent or caregiver or, or, or the patient, if they're old enough to do it, to, to take their temperature, to do their height and weight, uh, to give you that information, how they're feeling, how they look, uh, that would be general. Uh, they could even, you could even do some respiratory by asking them to take a deep breath and how do they feel with the deep breath and that kind of thing, okay? And skin, they can show you if they have any rashes. So it's very, very limited. 
Uh, documentation has to justify the visit being performed via telemedicine. State how the visit, this, this piece, for a lot of you, you may not have been doing it yet, so I want to make sure we get it in there now. Um, state how the visit is being performed. State who is on the call, uh, mom and patient present on FaceTime. State patient caregiver understands that the service is being performed through telemedicine and they agree to the service. This is really important. And the reason it is important is because if for some reason it comes back and they have to pay for it, they're going to tell you they didn't know they were going to be charged. They did not know that this was a real visit. So you might want to say something like, and, the, and this is just mine, please, you have your own, I'm sure. Um, today's vid is, visit is being performed through real-time audio video equipment, and the caregiver patient have been informed that patient may still need to be seen in the office or urgent care if I determine that would be best for the patient care. The patient and mom are both on this visit today and mom gives consent for this telemedicine visit. Mom is a historian for this visit. Now, what I have done is I've just told who's on the visit. I've told how the visit is being performed. I explained also that, in fact, we could go through this entire visit and then at the end, me as the provider would say, you know, I think this is a little more than we can handle over the audio video. Uh, can we bring you in? Okay, so we want to make sure they understand that because otherwise, um, if you say, well, we need to come in, they may not be happy about it because they just gave consent for the telemedicine service. Now, the telemedicine consent service and the tele and the the virtual visit will now be just part of the office visit when if they do come in at the same time. Okay. I also added mom is a historian for this visit. Why? Because remember in the data, in the medical decision making, I want to know who the historian is. Vitally important. Okay. Uh, further documentation, of course, is a history, the limited exam, then your medical decision making or time. Um, documentation is no, no different at all than a normal office visit other than the piece of that exam. So when you're gonna bill these visits, 99212 to 215, uh, 99201 to 205, um, or even the well care visits, please put that 95 modifier on there. And also it still places servant service 11 because it's an office visit. So it has to be placed as service 11, okay? Um, here's an example of an audio video E&M visit. Uh, basically, the, it's the same information. So Susie complains of wheezing since yesterday, as well as coughing, seems to be getting worse. And uh, mother did not want to come into the office, used albuterol inhaler, she had from her brother, uh, no fever, congestion, or nausea, had not had any wheezing in the past. So we have our four HPI, three review systems, one past medical history. So on our exam, you'll notice the temp and waiter for mom, constitutional appears alert and active, respiratory, wash child, take a deep breath. No retractions noted. Mom states that she uh, thinks there's a wheezing on exhale, but child did not have any difficulty breathing. So we have an expanded problem focused exam. We have two systems. Um, the plan is asthma with mild exacerbation. Mom to use a nebulizer with albuterol every three to four hours, which I'll order today. She'll call me tomorrow if child seems worse or not improving. So we have a prescription drug and we have a new problem without further workup. Now, you probably wouldn't use a diagnosis of asthma with mild exacerbation. Uh, you might use just wheezing or cough. I, I don't know. I just put that in there. Uh, remember, I wrote this and I'm not a, a physician. Uh, total time and visit, 23 minutes with greater than 50% spent in counseling, concerning the need for nebulizer treatments, possible need for steroids if worsens, and may need to come into office if no improvement. Um, so, this visit, based on the medical decision making as moderate, and of course that history is moderate, would be a 99214, based on that as well as time. Now, this is just a, a, a very typical example of an audio video uh, visit that you would perform in your office setting. Um, online digital evaluation and management service. All right, these are our codes for. Um, email or the portal. So let, 
And a lot of people, let me tell you, folks, pay attention. We have new codes this year. And a lot of people are still using that 99444 code um, that was in CPT before. That was deleted. And so if you're not getting paid for your e-digital visits, it's because you're using the wrong code. And I've, I've had a lot of questions about this just within the last three to four weeks. And so I'm not sure how it's gone back to the 99444 code. Our new codes, 99421, 422, and 423. Um, so 421 is an online digital ENM service for an established patient for up to seven days. So this is cumulative during this the seven days. Um, you cannot bill it if it's related to questions of a problem that was seen seven days earlier or in a post-op period. Usually uh, post-op period, well, that can affect you too. It's not for a discussion concerning results, okay? Um, that's not what this is. This is for to discuss a new problem that's going on and, and you're going to take care of it. All right. So these are timed codes. What that means is you don't have to have a history, physical, and medical decision making. It's strictly based on time. Um, so the first one is five to 10 minutes. Uh, second one is 11 to 20 minutes, and the third one is 21 or more minutes. Now, if you look over on the right-hand side, you'll see $17, $35, and $56. That's, that's based on, on um, uh, CMS. So your commercial payers really should be paying higher. And remember that when you're doing a um, e-visit, that's what I'm going to call them, an e-visit, it's, it's everything you're doing for that patient in, in a digital way. So it begins with you uh, personally reviewing the patient generated inquiry. Okay, so you, you get this uh, email through portal or you get a portal uh, notice or you get a e email if you have secure email, okay? And so you're gonna to look at the question and you're gonna review the patient records or data pertinent to the assessment of the patient problem and you may have to talk to somebody because mom said, you know, I talked to the nurse and she told me to do this and that. So you may have to talk to uh, clinical staff. To, now you have to develop a plan, uh, treatment tests, other communication, either online, telephone, email, other digital supported communication, what doesn't otherwise represent a separately reported service. Okay. So you're doing all this work. So all of that work is accumulated and timed. Now, you pretty much should have uh, a good idea of how much time you're taking. Now, if that means you want to record or you can record, you know, started to do this online 1215 and I finished the doing all of my work at 1230, you have 15 minutes. That might help you a little bit if you especially start it right as soon as you start your communication. Um, or even scribble a note. I don't care what you do, but you got to have your time down, okay? Um, all medical decision-making and subsequent management by anyone in the group practice contributes to the cumulative service time of the patient's online digital e &M service, okay? Online digital e &M service requires a permanent documentation storage, electronic or hard copy of the encounter. Remember, they're time-based. If, if you get an email, um, sorry, <laughs> my my screen went, did a little funny. I, you did probably didn't see it or my eyes are bad. Um, if you get an email on Monday and you answer it on Monday and then you get a, another response uh, email on Wednesday for the same problem, you're going to add all of these up. Okay, so you're going to add them all up. Online digital inquiries, the same or related problem within seven days or in a post-op period, not for discussion concerning test results. Remember that, okay? And also, you can't bill on a day when the physician or qualified healthcare professional reports an EM, EM service. If, if you did all this work um, prior to being seen and then you bring them in, all of this work goes into the history portion, okay? It's just, it's, that's just part of it, all right? So we have also the the qualified non-physician healthcare professional online digital evaluation management services. 
Uh, they have their own codes. They are exactly like the, the provider ones. So please understand that they are exactly alike. Um, according to the um, American Academy of Pediatrics, um, these qualified professionals could be speech language therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, social workers, or dietitian, nutritionists. I'm not sure why we couldn't have uh, lactation consultants in there. Um, I don't see any reason why not. Uh, an RN, a regular, rephrase it because I'm an RN, um, an RN without further designation such as a lactation consultant uh, probably should not use these codes. Uh, no, definitely should not use these codes, okay? But I just want to make sure you understand that they were there. Also, you see some G codes on here, G20681, 2061. These codes are um, CMS codes. These codes are Medicare codes. Now, there are some payers that want you to use these codes for their qualified um, healthcare providers, non-physician healthcare providers. But um, I'm gonna strongly recommend to you that when you're taking care of patients with commercial payers that you use the regular 989 codes, mostly because I've seen too many payers not recognize the G codes. And, and what you have to do then is you just have to flip them around and use the other codes, which delays your payments. So personally, you know, Medicaid every now and then will take the G codes, but a majority of times they'll go ahead and take the other codes, okay? Um, documentation, so uh, let's kind of look at this. When you use it, parent patient contacts you through your secure EHR portal, uh, secure email or other digital application, which allows digital communication. You receive a message through a secure email concerning a patient with direct exposure to COVID-19. Just giving you an example of the COVID piece. Father with confirmed case. Uh, criteria can be a new problem or established, but has to be an established patient. E visits have to be established patients. If during the seven day time frame the patient is seen for same problem, then work devoted to the online services incorporated into the visit, just like I said. So, an example of the documentation EM service via digital e visit with multiple secure emails. Mom understands about the e visit being telehealth service, gives consent. Again, same thing as an office visit. We wanna make sure people understand that this is a billable service and they're giving us consent to do it. Mom states an email that started with a cough today, fever 101, dad was positive for COVID uh, seven days ago, doing well and has been quarantined. Suggested child get tested, but mom prefers to wait if possible as she has two other children at home. Continue to monitor fever and contact me again tomorrow with an update. Total time, four minutes. Subsequent email, child's temp down, but still coughing, discuss over-the-counter cough med, continue watching in Motrin, probably URI, exposure to virus. Again, told mom that child could get tested. Mom to call or email me if does not seem to be improving. Total time, seven minutes, seven more minutes between emails and discussions for a total time of 11 minutes in e digital e-visit, okay? so. You're, you're going to write a note, a little note um, about the first piece or or you print that um, email and scan it into your system, okay? Or you can combine them all. That's kind of up to you. You want to make sure, though, it's vitally important you have something documented. Without the documentation, I can guarantee you this is going to go nowhere. In an audit, in the future, do I expect to see audits on digital visits and phone calls? Yes. Yes, I do. And I expect that because I think they're going to say, well, this is new. And so we can catch some people that haven't done the work properly. Okay. Anyway, this one would be uh, diagnosis JL 6.9 and Z20.828. Based on time, it'd be a 99422. Place of service for this one is 02. 02. And the reason it's 02, it's telehealth. It's not a 95, it's not an office visit, and it's through, and it's not through synchronous time. So it's telehealth, all right? So it's O2, place of service. Telephone call codes, 99441, 2, and 3. Basically, they're exactly the same as the e-digital codes, okay? They they cannot, have, cannot be a problem related within seven days or in a post-op period, 
and we cannot bill it if we see the patient within, um, well, they call it the next available appointment or the soonest appointment available, okay? Um, five to 10 minutes for 99441, uh, 442, 11 to 20, 443, 21 to 30. Now, I think, well, hopefully, a lot of you saw um, Chip Hart's uh, information that he had on changes to the 2020 RBRVS unit. Um, and in there, he talked about the telephone call code. So I was very excited to see this because what he, what they've done is they've actually made these codes, these here that have just never been paid for before ever, um, now are being reimbursed at the same amount as office visits. So a 99212, is the same as a 99441 and it's reimbursed at about $46. A 99213 is the same equivalent to a 99442 and it's reimbursed at $76 approximately and 99443 um, is going to be the same as a 99214 and it's about $110. Now, um, that's Medicare payment. Hopefully your, your payers are putting it pretty much equal to um, the office visits. That's that's the guideline with the AAP, AMA, and CMS, but that's how it's supposed to be. If you have not um, put your fees appropriately to match these fees, then you need to do that today. And the reason I say that is because a lot of you probably put these fees very, very low, thinking that they won't be covered, and actually they are being covered very well. So please make sure you have set these fees appropriately. Um, with the RVU being as high as they are, we want to make sure you maximize your reimbursement. So our telephone uh, code documentation, um, and again, we have our 99441, 2, and 3, and we have our 98966, 98968 for our non-physician uh, healthcare professionals. We're going to use this when a patient or parent calls in. Now, this is a really important piece. If they they have to call in, you cannot call them. So if you're calling them to give test results or something like that, it's not going to count. They will be calling in and then you can count it. OK, now, if you can't talk to them at that time and you return the call, that's perfectly OK. But they have to initiate the call. No different than a digital e m service that has to initiate the call, initiate the email. You cannot initiate any of it. If you do, it does not count. Um, remember that the documentation has to have the total amount of time spent on the phone and a brief description uh, presenting the problem and assessment and plan. So we want to make sure we get all that in. Uh, so an example, telehealth service via telephone call um, from father who understands about the visit and gives his consent. Seven-year-old with cough and slight fever. Father was exposed to COVID-19, but that was two weeks ago and he has no symptoms. No other problems and advised to watch and call in if cough worse or fever increases. Continue with over-the-counter medications for cough and fever. So we have a diagnosis of a cough and we have a suspected exposure. Total phone call time is eight minutes. And so that would be a 99441. Again, place of service 02. Now, when I talk about place of service, remember, if we're doing a virtual office visit, we have to have that 95 modifier to, to, to make sure they understand it's telemedicine. And then we have to use our, our place of service 11. On our digital um, non-audio video, we're going to use place of service 02, which simply says telehealth. Okay. Um, we have a G code called virtual check-in. And I put it in here. Um, just because I'm seeing a lot of people um, using it. Um, it's called a virtual check-in. By a physician or other qualified healthcare professional who can report it, can only be used by them, uh, not originating from a delete, uh, related EM service within seven days, is five to 10 minutes of medical discussion. This is usually used by Medicare only. Um, to me, uh, this is no different than our phone call or our e-digital codes. And so I, I put it in here because it is, it is out there in the universe and people are using it. But I'm gonna again recommend to you strongly that you use your office visit um, um, 
codes instead, or I'm sorry, your phone call or your digital e-visit codes. I just worry when you use a G code, um, there are so many payers that just do not recognize a G code unless it's a Medicare patient. Now, a few of you may have Medicare patients and so you may have to use this. Uh, most of you in pediatrics do not. We have a few providers that might see um, a subspecialty like cardiology, pulmonology, et cetera, and they may have some patients that are, are on Medicare nephrology. But other than that, for us in primary care pediatrics, we typically don't see Medicare. Um, now, everybody says, well, then use this for Medicaid. I got to tell you, in general, Medicaid tends to follow um, CPT. Every now and then you'll get a Medicaid plan that follows uh, CMS only. But in general, I, I, I just see them to follow CPT better. For me, I'm going to recommend and, you know, of course, you're going to do what you need to do to make sure you're, you're getting paid for your services. I, I think use our regular codes that we use for CPT. Uh, modifiers in place of service. Always check with your payers for their policies in regards to modifiers. If you put um, a modifier on, let's say you put an O2 modifier on a phone call and it comes back denied with invalid modifier. All right, so what you gotta say to yourself is, well, they're saying that's an invalid modifier. So what modifier do they want? Maybe they want place of service 11 for office visit because um, that's really the only two you can have. O2 telehealth or 11 for office visit, all right? And so sometimes they may want that. If they say invalid modifier on an office visit with a 95, maybe they don't want the 95. So it's, it's really, in, you need to make sure that your payers and you understand the payers policies. Um, because I got to tell you, it's it's all over the place sometimes. When it first started out, everybody was using uh, 95 modifier with O2, and then we got hit with, you can't use this modifier, uh, you can't use this place of service, so we switched everything to 11, and then we got payers saying, no, you can't use 11. So I'm going to tell you how it typically is running right now. 95 modifier will go on all office quote, quote, office visits that are done through telemedicine. Uh, no 95 modifier on a phone call or e-digital codes, okay? Office visit or 95 modifier with place of service 11 uh, for office visits and uh, phone calls and e-digital place of services 02. Now, we have two other modifiers, uh, GQ, I think that's a book, isn't it? Or a magazine, GQ magazine? Well, anyway. Um, our providers participating in the federal telemedicine demonstration programs in Alaska uh, via asynchronous telecommunication system. For Alaska and Hawaii, they have to use a GQ modifier. GT modifier is basically was saying same thing, audio video. Um, but only use that G2 modifier if your payer says you have to. And you want that in writing. And the reason you want that in writing is because Medicare stopped the use of the modifier GT in 2017 when the place of service code 02 came into effect. And so um, if your payer rejects telemedicine claim with the 95 modifier is not appropriate, ask about the GT modifier. They may not have ever updated their system. But I can tell you GT was deleted from Medicare. And that's why we got the O2 modifier. Again, place of service 11 for your office visits, O2 for your telehealth services, e-digital and telephone calls. Um, so that's kind of the end of my talk, but I want to just remind you of some of my thoughts. You know how I am. I always like to share my thoughts. Um, I'm the kind of grandmother who burns one side of the grilled cheese sandwich and serves it to her grandkids with the non-burned side down and hopes they don't notice. I'm having a salad for lunch, so that means I can have three dozen peanut butter cups for dinner. Never in the history of calm down has everyone calmed down by being told to calm down, especially in today. Always get, this is for the men listening, okay? Always get your wife a snack at the gas station. If you think to yourself, maybe she doesn't want a snack, you're wrong. Just get the woman a snack for Pete's sake. 
Okay, so I'm going to turn it back over to Jan and let's see where <laughs> we go. Get that snack. You're killing me. Oh my God. These, I, I look forward to your last slide every time, not because it means your, your presentation's over, because it's always the funniest one of all of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I've actually done the grilled cheese one. <laughs> oh my gosh. I did well, don't tell my husband, but I did that to him last week. Oh <laughs> <laughs> you always hope they don't notice. Ooh, and he didn't. I'm lucky. I'm married to a, a lovely man who likes things a little bit on the bar the burn side. So even burn my side. even my my kitchen <laughs> mistakes are forgiven. He's awesome. Um we do have a handful of questions if you don't mind. Right. Um we in addition to huge appreciation uh, immediately before you you uttered your first word people were excited to say they miss you and they wish we were all together um so lots of love coming to you from through chat uh in addition to questions so there was uh, the very first question was we recently contacted all our insurers and we received the green light for our nurses and mas to bill for non-physician services bill those non-physician codes really? uh, yeah, for the, in specific, they said for non-physician HCPs because of COVID until further notice. And they, the person asking was very surprised um, and asked, would appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, as long as it's in writing, if it's in writing, I would absolutely get that, put it in a frame, have it ready mm -hmm. and challenge them. When they, when they come in and audit you and you get hit, you can just hand them that and say, well, according to this, you have allowed that. As long as they've got it in writing, they're good. When it's not in writing and just somebody over the phone telling you this, I never do it. But if it's in writing, that. I would absolutely go for it. And I think that's great. I wish everybody would do that, but some are being very, very picky when it comes to the phone call codes and an RN or MA doing it. Yeah. I, my experience too, is I've seen some of them be so specific. And again, you get it in writing everywhere you can. Right. Um, the, so one carrier was so specific as to say that the way that they define the non-physician qualified healthcare professionals is anybody who has an NPI. Uh, those are the, those are the non-physician QHCP. So if they have an NPI and they can bill independently that, you know, if you go through credentialing them, that was their level, that was their litmus test. But you, you know, you That's, hit the nail on the head when you said it's all over the map. You, you yeah, it is. And oh my gosh, you can you can have one carrier saying, "Oh yeah, this person can do this and this and this and this, and it's perfectly fine." And you can have another carrier saying, "No, only these people with MPI numbers." Well, they can bill separately anyway. So it's like, well, wait a second. If they're credentialed, they yeah. don't even sit into this category. They fit into this category. Right. And so it's very hard to know. So if it's not in writing, I'm going to go by what AMA CMS states. If it's in writing by a carrier, by golly, I'll go for it. Like I had one the other day that she got it in writing where one of the blues said to them, for your office visits, you have to use place of service O2. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> okay. I said, that's fine. You know, as long as they're paying you the same amount, but keep that because if they come back and say all of these were invalid place of service and you have to refile them all, it's no big deal. Change it to 11. But if you don't have to do that, show them the paper. Yeah. Anytime we have a paper, we can prove it. Yeah. Yep. Indeed. The other, the other thing, if you don't mind me adding on, Oh no. Um, the, the other bit of advice that I've been trying to remember to share is that even if they say until the end of the public health emergency, make sure you get that date and you get their definition of the end of the public health emergency because this right. has been yeah these have been there have been declarations at the national level at well, that's the, a good that's a good thing at the state level and then yeah. at you know county and town levels so make sure you know which whose declaration whose end date right. they're talking right. about get a calendar date and not just right. the end of the emergency right and is the emergency end when we have a vaccine i mean well, or does it just stop because we we don't know any of this information. My hope is that even at the end of everything, we'll still get paid for these services. I hope so. I, I talked with a client just yesterday who said that already their carrier, the carriers in their state, uh, this specifically was Florida, that the carriers in their state are starting to back off on payment for telemedicine. They've had to really watch them super closely and hold their feet to the fire. It's, it's turned into another part-time job just to make sure yeah. everybody's complying with what they've promised. Yeah. 
Thanks yeah. so much. So we've got one other question and, uh, and, and another alert coming at me. So I'll read that next is uh, for the 99421 through 99423 codes, should the cumul cumulative time be based on the same diagnosis code? Well, um, I probably, you know, you could bill it twice if you wanted to. I mean, like if you have a, a one email that's strictly about a fever um, and, and that's all it was about, and then you finish it and it's six minutes long or something, mm. you could bill it. And then if you get a, another email five days later about a cough, they are separate and you can bill them, okay? If they are distinctly different, if they are the same at all, then they have to be combined. So if they're just different, diagnosed, different problem, different problem initiates a different service. Okay, so they can't, so they want to make sure they document this first one <laughs> thoroughly and with time, and then the second one thoroughly with time. Because CMS did remove the limitations, the numbers, um, otherwise they were kind of stuck at seven days, you could only go one, but if they're distinctly different issues, not related to each other, absolutely. Yeah, and there's a, a related question to that uh, further, which date should be used? Should it be the date on the first day or the seventh day? Uh, well, I would put, if, if we have seven days worth of, of e-medicine, okay, e-visits, mm -hmm. I would probably put a start date of when it started and I would list all the dates that you actually did something. Because, I mean, you can bill it at the seventh day. It doesn't matter. You want to you wanna make sure the visit is finished. I don't know how to describe that. Yeah, I think you I know what you mean. You want to make sure you're finished with it. Because two days later, if another email pops up, then it's like, ah, that one's related to this. And we already built it. And that was only, that was 10 minutes. Now this is three more minutes. So now we're at another code. Mm -hmm. So I would wait seven days to make sure and then bill it on the seventh day. But the date of service are all of those dates. I would start with whatever the first day is for the date of service. You know, I don't think that's going to make a big deal of difference. Yeah. Awesome. And let me just, I'd had a couple of those, uh, a couple of messages come through. Um, all right, one more question. Yeah, so when there are clinically related portal messages and phone calls initiated by, initiated by the parent or patient in the week following a telemed or off, excuse me, I'm getting off a climb with these questions. Uh, <laughs> follow, let me start over to get this in its, in its entirety. When there are clinically related portal messages and phone calls initiated by the parent or patient in the week following a telemed or office visit, can the overall work and time involved in the visit, electronic messaging and phone calls all be combined when choosing that E and M level. And if the E and M level is after those, yes. But if you've already done an E and M level and all those come after, no. I mean, you should. I mean, you can. You still got to document all of this other stuff going on. Mm -hmm. But if it's related to this visit that happened on Monday, and then they call you on Wednesday, ah, uh, no. If this is included here, and then they send you an email on Thursday. This is included here, unless there's anything different. Now, if you can have a different issue going on, a different diagnosis, then yes. But if it's related in that seven days, no, you know. Now, here's something that, you know, I'm, I'm very, very careful when it comes to coding. But people have asked, well, what if I have lab work done? Uh, I want lab work done. And then... Um, but it's going to take uh, a week or so before I get it back. Can I call them and bill for that? No, you cannot. You cannot initiate the call. However, you can ask mom to call in. <laughs> but it's seven days later. <laughs> that's a little sneaky. I know. I'm a little sneaky. But I mean, that's really the only way to do that. Otherwise, your phone call to them um, is is gone. Yeah, it disqualifies the the use of the code. Right. Yeah. yeah. So if it's anything related, unfortunately, you know, now if you have this phone call and a couple e-messages and then you do a visit, all of this is added in here. Okay. Mm -hmm. It might help the code a little bit. It's mostly history though. So it's probably not, it might help the medical decision go up a little bit. It just depends on what's going on. But if it's prior, 
or you know all of this comes after no you're stuck yeah that likelihood that it's unrelated enough yep yep cool well, that is the end of the questions we've received so far. I, as usual, Donnell, I don't know how to thank you enough for, for sharing all this with us. We, we will have you back as often as you'll come. It, uh, <laughs> well, you, as long you, as I don't get too old for people to say, oh my gosh, that woman needs to quit. <laughs> <laughs> Never. I, I, I have a really hard time imagining that one. <laughs> well, um, I do want to say uh, thank you to everyone who's listening. Um, I do, I do really, with all sincerity in my heart, miss seeing you. Um, some of you, uh, you know, I want to, I mean, hey, Dr. Morgan Howard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming that, sorry, I'm um, I just feel like um, PCC in general is a family. I think the, the, all of the providers, the billers, the administrators, all of them are just in this for the long haul, work hard. Mm -hmm. And all of this stuff I just talked about is a shame you have to work so hard to do it correctly, but we do. If we get an audit, we want to be able to defend ourselves. And I know that sounds terrible. We ought to be able to just whatever we're writing should be enough. It's never enough. And, and Jan and I both have gone through audits with people where they've been audited by somebody and it's tough to fight these people i mean you we can and jan and i bounce things off of each other all the time mm -hmm. we can fight for what we believe is correct but the payer is the one that's going to determine it that's true so the best we can do document 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 as hard as that is but now you, if you have an ehr it's better. It's so much better. You can make your templates, you can make your phrases so that you just get it in there. Get all that information in there. Because let me tell you, come 2021, you better have that information. Especially oh, yeah. for medical decision making. It's going to be our key next year and it's going to be a toughie. And did, that it will. Yeah. So please come back tomorrow. And once again, thank you, Donnell. Have a thank great, you. great night. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.